This sermon was preached on Sunday, October 11th, 2015 at New Hope Lutheran Church in Farley, Iowa. I'm Pastor Arnold Flater. This sermon, entitled, I the Lord Test the Mind and Search the Heart, was part three of a stewardship sermon series from 2015. The Bible passage for the sermon is Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, beginning at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Like the partridge hatching what it did not lay, so are all who amass wealth unjustly. In midlife it will leave them, and at their end they will prove to be fools. O glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, Shrine of our sanctuary, O hope of Israel, our Lord. All who forsake you shall be put to shame, and those who turn away from you shall be recorded in the underworld, for they have forsaken the fountain of living water, the Lord. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, Remember this promise of God, who says, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The very center of our life of stewardship is based on the fact that we trust God. In that trust, we know that God provides all that we need. God has blessed us with all things. And in that blessing, we naturally share what we have received and share it with the world. Life is a gift that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. When we share our lives with the world, we know that gift and that promise. Please listen. Life is a gift. The greatest gift that has ever been given is life. Life is good. God made it, God made us to be good. Each breath we take is a gift from the creator of the universe, who desires nothing more than to know us, bless us, use us. We have been richly blessed, but many of us are absorbed in day-to-day -day existence. And somewhere along the way, we forget that we have been blessed for a reason, blessed to be a blessing. This life is not only ours for the taking, but was given as a gift. We all have something to offer, rich, young, poor, black, white, old, all of us. So why do Christians still give away less than 2.8% of their money? What if our perspectives just need to change a little bit? If we realize or even remember that we've been given the greatest gift ever, life, abundant life through Jesus Christ. Then we begin to see everything around us as if it actually belongs to God. And we are free to give back to God by radically giving to others, sacrificially giving to others, cheerfully giving to others. Imagine then, if we held nothing back, if we place it all, everything in God's hands. Then God in turn blesses others who bless others, who bless others, who bless, well, you get the idea creating a ripple of blessing, a movement, a blessing, a flood of blessing that keeps going and going and going. What if that was the plan all along? Leroy Henkel and my father, Alvin Flater, were both farmers from the Midwest during the Great Depression. My dad farmed here in Iowa and Leroy was from Nebraska. 
Each man told stories of the powerful drought that came with that Great Depression in the 1930s. Leroy tells stories, stories that are similar to those I heard growing up. The drought was real. That depression left a lasting imprint on those who lived through it and in the years to follow through the stories they shared with their sons and daughters. Some 60 years after that drought and after the Great Depression, Leroy Henkel talks of the power of the drought as if it was yesterday. Boy, we had dust here, and we, you couldn't keep a house clean or anything. You didn't know. It was dust all the time. Uh, we had a sprinkle, of, oh, I don't know if it was April or May, and uh, I happened to be in Seward. And just the way the drops fell down on the sidewalk, they was all scattered around there, and they just maybe a little puddle of mud right around there, just done drops. You could just, everything was covered with dust. And that's the way, 34, to me, 34 was probably the worst drought of the year that we had in the whole bunch. The other years seemed like in the spring you would get just a rain or two. It would make first crop of hay and, and uh, get everything, corn and everything get started. And uh, even a few years, it was a little bit wet. Just, and then the corn did get up. It was starting to tassel. I remember we was coming home with a combine. We just got through combine and our corn was up over our heads and it looked good. And in about three, four days, it was, well, we already knew that we lost it. It just got hot and just, just, Corn, corn just dried right up. I am thankful for the work of Bible scholar William Holliday. In his commentary, Jeremiah, he explains that this passage offers so much that is relevant to the human condition of every generation. Again, the context of these words is so important for us. As I've said, Holliday believes that the events described in chapter 17 took place during a drought. The pressure was real. The people's ability to trust God was falling during that difficult time. In explaining today's verse and the words around it, we have an unusual situation. We hear this, the heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart. Dr. Holliday encourages us to understand that the Hebrew word for heart is also used to describe the mind, the will, and the central faculty with which a person makes decisions, but also the center by which the community makes its decisions. Bible passages like Genesis chapter 6 also describes God's feelings or God's heart before the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, we hear, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. The word heart in the Old Testament is often depicted as a place of righteousness and even holiness before God. The human reality or heart is in creation good. So Jeremiah has to throw in an adjective or two to describe this condition, this unusual condition. This is not who human beings are. We are not created as devious or perverse. Yet that seems to be the prophet's observation. As I said last week, Jeremiah is going through some real stuff here. There's an invading army coming. The political aspirations of the rulers are getting the people off track. And at the same time, the people of God are turning against Jeremiah. That drought remains. And yes, exile is coming. Jeremiah was driven by his own experience to a desperate conclusion then. He believed the human heart is devious, past all accounting. If left to our own device, we shall surely fail. God knows our hearts, and is God's intention that in the ongoing gift of Christ, the place of the heart will not be devious or perverse. The writers of the Acts of the Apostles already know this to be true in the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we hear in chapter 15 of Acts, And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and the cleansing of their hearts by faith. Jeremiah, in his dismay, does hear of a new reality of the human condition later in Jeremiah, the book Jeremiah. 
We're going to hear that text on Reformation Sunday in just a couple of weeks. We hear this. But after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law upon them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. With all this Old Testament teaching and guiding, we Christians do sit up and take notice then when Jesus speaks. No, actually, when he names our situation coming from the gifts of the Old Testament, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, you are asked to do a heart check to recognize our investment for life. In other words, where your heart is. So then Jesus continues and reminds us later on in chapter 6 of Matthew that no one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. What God has given you does not belong to you, but has been placed in your hands for you to use as a steward, all for God's glory and for God's justice in the world. That goes for your time and your energy, but also for your money. Again, this truth remains. There is no other way to look at your possessions or your bank accounts, which you hold, for they are God's gift to be used for God's intention in the world. Yes, indeed. The question remains, where is your heart? As I said in this series, I subscribe to the daily devotional from the Reverend Dr. David Lowe's called In the Meantime. Pastor Lowe's offers great insight to help us see God talk in what some would say is the secular world, like in the work of Sean Acor. Sean Acor has taught psychology at Harvard and is now CEO of Good Think. Last week, in the last couple of weeks, I've shared part of his popular TED Talk, and his ideas help us reflect on the idea of trusting Christ as the center of all things. Today, a few more minutes from his TED Talk, which helps us to recognize the possibility of progress and place in God's way. It's, it's a tricky business for us Christians, but it's important. The past couple of weeks, I've introduced a story that has Sean telling of a childhood incident in which his sister fell off of his bunk bed, and Sean was keeping her from crying and said, don't wait, don't cry. You fell like a unicorn. You must be a unicorn. He was putting a different reality into her head. Today, then, he continues to help us understand the power of choosing a reality of possibility. I think these ideas point us to Christ. As Christ followers, we can dare to experience our hearts filled with Christ. Instead of distractions, other distractions of the world that might steal away our attention. Let's listen again to Sean Acor in his TED Talk. And says, why? Why is it that some of you are so high above the curve in terms of your intellectual ability, athletic ability, musical ability, creativity, energy levels, your resiliency in the face of challenge, your sense of humor? Whatever it is, instead of deleting you, what I want to do is study you. Because maybe we can glean information, not just how to move people up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up at our companies and schools worldwide. The reason this graph is important to me is when I turn on the news, it seems like the majority of the information is not positive. In fact, it's negative. Most of it's about murder, corruption, diseases, natural disasters. And very quickly, my brain starts to think that's the accurate ratio of negative to positive in the world. What that's doing is creating something called the medical school syndrome which if you know people who have been to medical school during the first year of medical training, as you read through a list of all the symptoms and diseases that could happen, suddenly you realize you have all of them. <laughs> I have a brother-in-law named Bobo, which is a whole other story. Bobo <laughs> married Amy the Unicorn. Bobo called me on the phone <laughs> from Yale Medical School. From Yale Medical School, and Bobo said, Sean, I have leprosy. <laughs> which even at Yale is extraordinarily rare but I had no idea how to console poor Bobo because he had just gotten over an entire week of menopause. <laughs> See, what we're finding is it's not necessarily the reality that shapes us, but the lens through which your brain views the world that shapes your reality. And if we can change the lens, not only can we change your happiness, we can change every single educational and business outcome at the same time. When I applied to Harvard, I applied on a dare. I didn't expect to get in, and my family had no money for college. When I got a military scholarship two weeks later, they allowed me to go. Suddenly, something that wasn't even a possibility became a reality. When I went there, I assumed everyone else would see it as a privilege as well, that they'd be excited to be there. Even if you're in a classroom full of people smarter than you, you'd be happy just to be in that classroom, which is what I felt. But what I found there is while some people experienced that, when I graduated after my four years and then spent the next eight years living in the dorms with the students, Harvard asked me to. I um, wasn't that guy. But what happened... <laughs> 
I was an officer of Harvard to counsel students through the difficult four years, and what I found in my research and my teaching is that these students, no matter how happy they were with the original success of getting into the school, two weeks later, their brains were focused not on the privilege of being there, nor on their philosophy or their physics. Their brain was focused on the competition, the workload, the hassles, the stresses, the complaints. When I first went in there, I walked into the freshman dining hall, which is where my friends from Wake... The way we view our reality in Christ will be where we invest ourselves. Sean Acor's teaching in positive psychology helps me remember that too much of our time in ministry of the gospel is spent focusing on what we lack rather than what God has given us to use. So during this fall season of stewardship, I'm sharing stories of stewards who have been mentors to me and who remain faithful in their life, in most cases, unexpected response. I began two weeks ago with Carla Corey, a gentleman from my first congregation that, despite trials in life, stayed faithful to the end of his life as a good steward. Last week, I offered a triad of stewards, a Pentecostal named Gordon Dace, a Unitarian Universalist pastor named Mariano Judas, and a Greek Orthodox priest named Father Dustin. They are my friends and are all stewards that help me understand the way of stewardship. Today, then, I want to introduce you to Pastor Ernie Philippi, a Lutheran pastor. Pastor Ernie was a farm boy from Nebraska, and I was a farm boy from Iowa. Pastor Ernie was our pastor when Julie and I farmed the family farm back in the 1980s. In those days, we had a crop rotation of corn, soybeans, and pigs. I enjoyed the swine production, but what I really enjoyed was building our own confinement facilities to house those pigs. Uh, pastor Ernie enjoyed visiting our farm and seeing how things had changed when he was a boy on the farm during the Great Depression. It was during one of those tours of our farm that I got a little full of myself and told him we were doing very, very well. We had excellent production statistics in our swine, and, and yeah, yeah, we were getting rich. Uh, then it happened. Then he asked me, uh, So, um, Arnold, what are you doing with all that money? My quick answer, my 25-year-old mind answer was, uh, uh, put it in the bank. It was then that we went from a farm visit to a stewardship lesson. I remember thinking, oh, no, really? Now? But he was persistent, and he was right, and he was a blessing. He went on to explain that we all have come from God's good bounty. Everything we have is from that bounty, and sharing that bounty is God's desire for us. Start small, he said, and grow each year just a little bit until you reach that tithe of that 10%. You won't regret it. And he was right. Pastor Ernie Philippi remained a good friend and pastoral mentor for some 20 years until his death in 2004. Here he is on my ordination day. An important presence. In fact, I wear Pastor Ernie's alb every time I preach. Next week, we're going to ask you to sign a commitment card to support this ministry and Christ's ministry in the world. I know this might be new for some of you. I realize that it might make you uncomfortable. Pastor Ernie, though, taught me to encourage my people because it leads to such blessing. If you're new to this and have reservations, try to think of it like this. Have you ever subscribed to the newspaper? Have you ever financed an auto with a car dealer? Have you ever taken out a home loan with a bank? These are all commitments. The only difference is, is that if uh, you don't make your payment to the newspaper, you don't get a newspaper. If you fall short on your car loan, they take back your car. If you don't make your house mortgage, you're out on the street. But when you promise God, you, your promise comes from what God loans you. So if something changes and you lose your job, your promise will naturally change. The church will understand. If you're giving 10% of your income and it falls, it would naturally change. So in the world, if you don't pay, you don't receive. But you don't pay God to receive. You pay in response to what God has given you. Nothing will change. God will always love you. The gift of grace is always present. So dare to trust. Dare to trust God. Open your heart to God's busy Holy Spirit. If you're giving 2%, why not go up to 3 If you're not giving at all, start small. Maybe just $15 a week. A small lunch or a couple of coffees. Um, this ministry and its future depends on your growth and giving. Make plans to someday to reach that tithe. It takes years, but make plans now. 
God is present in this decision. And God is with us, even now. And yes, please hear these words as promise. As the Lord God said in the prophet Jeremiah, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Amen.